Um, I'm going to go through, this is going to be basically um, birding 101, um, introduction to birding. I'm going to go through why, um, who, when, where, when, very briefly on a lot of those subjects. And we'll just begin with why birding. Um, birds were revered um, by mankind worldwide. They're in literature, they're in arts, a lot of culture. Um, it's not hard to see why. This was a frilled coquette um, uh, displaying hummingbird down in Brazil. Uh, birds are really beautiful. Um, they're worldwide. You can see them in cities anywhere where there's vegetation. Um, this is a flock of southern carmen bee eaters down in Namibia. You don't have to travel far to see birds. Uh, this is a Bullock's Oriole. This is a common bird in Cottonwood Groves. Um, even around Vancouver this morning, there were some down at uh, on River Road. Birds are really fun to watch. Um, this is a bird that doesn't recognize itself. It's a, a southern masked weaver. And they have all kinds of interesting behavior. Um, here we have um, a courtship display of sheer tailed tyrants uh, down in Brazil. Um, these are, birds are like crazy. They have lots of elaborate courtships. Um, a lot of these birds um, locally have neat courtships. Um, we don't have to go very far, like I say. You can go and watch Western grebes and do their dance. Um, there's a head bobbing, head waving by woodpeckers. And birding takes you outdoors. It's healthy, it's good for the soul. Um, it's, I don't know if it's that healthy wearing, um, going barefoot in a neotropical creek. I used running shoes in, in Panama, but um, it is good for the soul. Good for... And birding can, it helps preserve um, our habitat across the world. Um, when people go to um, a bird in remote places, if the communities find out that there's value in it, um, that gives them an incentive to uh, preserve you know, the woodlands here, this was in Peru in 2009, we were told about um, a long whiskered owlet in Peru that were found by um, the, the Neotropical Primate Conservation Center, and they were studying yellow-tailed um, woolly monkeys, an endangered species. And as a result, they wanted to save these species, so um, they built the lodges. Uh, we had to do an eight-hour hike, but they're preserving the habitat. Birding takes you to really crazy places. You can see spectacular um, features that are non-birds. This is an amazing ironwood uh, tree down in Quiquitos, uh, um, Peru. Two birds. Um, in Canada, the greatest number of birders um, was aged between 35 and 54. Uh, the greatest number of participants for age class was greater than 54. Uh, most experts are older, um, they stay and spend um, at places and travel more, and they tend to have um, a higher education and tend to be professional um, based on other groups. There's a bunch of local birders, I don't know if people recognize Vivica and uh, Grasses and Rick Tuchin. Tom. Peter. Yeah. I'm um, sorry to interrupt. Uh, there was a request if you could push your screen down so they can see your face. Right now, we're only getting your eyes in perfect. Now, maybe a touch more, just a smidgen what? more. What? I don't yeah, want no, to see me. Because you're beautiful. I'm conscious. <laughs> That's perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, one group of uh, birders are feeder watchers. There's uh, 52 million Americans that feed birds regularly. And when asked why, it's kind of the obvious for fun to bring nature to their home and enjoy uh, bird songs. Um, here in Canada, uh, we have a feeder watch, uh, Project Feeder Watch was, had its roots in Ontario, and uh, a lot of people feed birds there in the winter. Um, the Cornell Lab and Bird Studies Canada partnered, and today there's over 20,000 participants um, in North America. Um, I don't know if people are going to recognize, but um, the bird on the top right, uh, the 
uh, this bird right here, the cursor, that's a, uh, a lesser goldfinch. This shot was taken in Abbotsford. Um, feeder watching can give us all kinds of really neat information. Um, this is some information uh, gleaned from it. And here are Cooper's hawks. And there's a, a definite increase of Cooper's hawks going to feeders as they recognize it's a great place to find food. Uh, the population of Cooper hawks um, aren't really increasing. It's just that more and more are staying to over winter because they have a regular food supply. Uh, feeders also show the sort of Northwest orientation and spread of uh, Eurasian collared doves. Um, they were first released in Florida, and now you can see by 2014, um, they had gone all the way up into uh, Northern British Columbia. Another interesting thing about the feeding, uh, uh, the information is that uh, they discovered that um, common red poles occurrence are uh, super irregular, and that's based on um, uh, food supply shortages. So every second or third year, um, we get uh, eruptions down here. Uh, that was one group of birds, um, bird uh, uh, feeder watchers. There's another whole class of birders. A lot of people that go out and these are the more serious types and these are the birders and listers. Uh, listers uh, tend to travel a lot and they go to great lengths for new birds. And as is implied, <laughs> they do keep lists. Um, this is a, a British Columbia field one. I thought it was Lister's Corner. So this is for um, members of the BCFO, which is a organization that's for serious birders or you know, in British Columbia. And you can post all your different numbers for each of the lists. They have lists for or British Columbia, Canada, there's patch lists, uh, all kinds of different geographic areas, there's years lists. Um, that was uh, one for the members of British Columbia Field Ornithologists. This is the uh, Surf Birds. Surf Birds is a, a website that's open to the public um, and people from all over the world um, can post their lists and the, uh, the lists cover um, basically every country in the planet and um, also includes mammals in that. So a lot of serious listers uh, use, use the site to post uh, their birds and you can see some of the commonest, uh, um, uh, some of the comments that people have written uh, for Michael Bentley, a friend of mine, he's got the high, very high Canadian list. Uh, I think it's second or first, um, well, in by surf birds is number one, but uh, he still needs rock time again for uh, Canada, which is pretty amazing. Um, birders play lots of games. Um, and so there's big days, there's big years, there's big sets, uh, lots of games that challenge themselves and others. Uh, basically just trying to record as many species as you can in a certain time period. Um, this was just uh, myself and uh, Rick Tuchin, Mike Tuchin and Danny Tyson. We did get the record, but this was years ago. This was 1996. And uh, subsequent to that, um, young birders uh, uh, just broke it by a few species, even though at the time I thought that was, uh, this record was gonna hold. Um, Photography is huge. Um, it's great because it's uh, people get to go enjoy nature and gets more people interested, but at the same time, it can be a real problem. Um, here, uh, locally, <coughs> owls attract uh, photographers. And if you get too many that trample around, like at Brunswick Point, for example, looking for short ears, or long-eared owls, um, you can disturb the birds and um, those roosting sites, the short-eared owls, long-eared sawwets use are really important for uh, thermal regulation. They need that to conserve energy to go hunting at night. A lot of people, including myself, or a few people, including myself, um, enjoy to um, 
doing um, trips, um, self-guided by ourselves. But um, even though it has its rewards, you have to be ready for an adventure. And um, most people prefer um, to go on um, a tour group when there's all kinds of tour groups available. There's Eagle Eye Tours in Canada. There's um, Abbasset Tours, uh, Rick Charlesworth in the Okanagan, um, all kinds of uh, tours available from the hardcore to the um, easier tours. Okay, that's <clears throat> kind of sort of who birds. And now we're going to get into um, how to bird. Um, we're having fun here. This is the most important thing is that birding should be fun and leave some co workers out in the field. <clears throat> the, excuse me. The first thing that uh, a person needs to have is a, um, a good pair of binoculars. Um, there's tons available. Because birding is a visual activity, it's probably going to be the most important piece of equipment that you have. And I would suggest getting the best pair of binoculars that you can afford. And um, probably the best place in Canada to get those would be at Peely Wings Nature Store. They have the uh, uh, huge selection and the cheapest price in Canada. Scopes are more for serious birders. Um, having said that, um, they're really, it's really useful to have one down here locally because we have a lot of shorebirds, a lot of gulls, a lot of open country birds. They're heavy. They can be cumbersome to carry around. Um, so I, I tend to be a bit lazy sometimes. I, don't go to bird. I don't know with a scope very often, but um, uh, really handy here. Scopes are great for identifying birds at a distance. This is a tiny hawk, not because it's far away, but because it is actually a tiny hawk. It's uh, the smallest occipiter um, in um, the Neotropics, well, actually, and the New World. It's uh, much smaller than a sharp shin. But scopes allow you to get those close views and identify things that you might not know. And the telescopes are really useful for showing other people birds. Um, um, these kids may not be looking at birds, um, but they are enjoying themselves. And that is the whole point of going outside and birding. <laughs> well, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, well, some of the literature. Um, this was the Birds of Canada. It was written by Earl Godfrey. Earl Godfrey is almost a father of, of birding in Canada. It was published in 1966. Um, he was an avid birder himself. He inspired tons of people uh, to go birding. This is a memoriam written by Ron Pittaway. Um, and uh, when I grew up uh, in Ottawa in the early 70s, um, if we found a rare bird, we would phone God, AKA Earl Godfrey, and he would come down and verify it and give him, give it its blessing. But um, he's a very famous person in uh, Canadian birding history. It was Earl Godfrey and the Birds of Canada. Um, <clears throat> nowadays, um, things are quite different. Uh, we have eBird and all kinds of other books. Um, but when I started out, uh, we had the Peterson and the uh, Golden Guide to Birds Identification. Both of them are still um, totally uh, relevant. A bit of, <clears throat> a bit of um, BC bird literature. Um, the Cannings brothers, that would be Sid, Rob, and Dick, um, produced the birds of the Okanagan. It's, uh, and, uh, this was back in 1987. It's an excellent reference for the birds of the Okanagan and a good piece of um, BC uh, bird literature. <clears throat> this is the uh, Birds of British Columbia. It's a, a four volume set. Uh, the first volume coming out in 1990 and the last volume coming out in 2001. It's um, the most comprehensive book uh, on birds of British Columbia today. Um, 
despite its, I mean, it's a little bit outdated, but it's still an incredible resource. Um, the problem with it is that it is four volumes and the books are huge. Another <clears throat> really important resource, um, uh, this is free, it's online, open to the public, just um, Google breeding birds, breed BC, is the Atlas of uh, Breeding Birds of British Columbia. And um, the Atlas uh, treats um, all the breeding birds of British Columbia and gives you um, excellent uh, range and abundance maps for each of those species. It's free, it's online. And finally, we come to essential books. And um, essential, what you're gonna need to start birding, the most important thing is a good field guide. Uh, some people use the Sibley's up top, uh, uh, others the Peterson. I myself uh, prefer the National Geographic. And without question, it's in a really good book. Um, if you live in Vancouver, you got to get yourself the Birders Guide to Vancouver. You've probably heard this story. You probably heard it from Colin, but it is a really good book, um, and it's got amazing pictures. Um, it almost serves a field guide because there's so many pictures. And of course, uh, in British Columbia, you've got uh, uh, the Cannings. Uh, this is, would be Dick and um, his son Russ uh, Cannings are doing the bird finding in British Columbia. <laughs> it tells you um, all the places you could go, really good spots throughout the uh, province. <clears throat> if you, a lot of serious birders or, or the, the one sort of group um, that does uh, deal with uh, serious birders um, is the British Columbia Field Ornithologist. They have uh, a yearly publication, a journal, a, British, uh, uh, a yearly produced journal, and they also have a, a newsletter it comes out. Um, here's uh, just uh, some of the other equipment you might want to use um, for birding. Um, GPS, well, most uh, cameras and um, well, I said have G apps have the GPS anyways. I use a good light, um, uh, a Phoenix light. Um, I don't, I'm not a true, true believer in, well, I just want to say that uh, if you're going to be using lights, be, re be really careful and, and not shining in, uh, um, in uh, nocturnal bird's eyes, um, uh, maybe below the bird or something. Um, but a good light is really handy if you want to go look for uh, uh, your goat suckers, your night hawks and stuff, your owls uh, and rails and stuff. And then finally, you got your recordings. Um, this is uh, a page from Zeno Canto. Zeno Canto is um, a site where the public can share their bird sounds from around the world. And what you can do, um, like, or before I go on a trip, I'll go, let's say, I'm going to go to the Okanagan. Well, I'll go on to um, uh, Zeno Canto and I'll go, okay, I want to hear the different sounds of the uh, dusky flycatcher. So I'll go to dusky flycatcher and search for dusky flycatchers um, that are um, recorded in British Columbia. You want to do that because... Um, uh, most species have different dialects depending um, on where you're, where they're coming from. But it's really handy. I'm not a big proponent of um, using recordings because in some instances, uh, let's say, I know, let's say there's a tanager finch in, in um, Ecuador that um, people use playback so often it actually changed its song. But um, it's useful if you use it uh, judiciously. In most parks, it's illegal to use the uh, sound recordings. Oh, thanks. Nowadays, <clears throat> a lot of people are into um, e-birding. Um, they keep their lists on e-bird. Um, you can explore um, every species around the, uh, on the planet, uh, where they live, their abundance, look for photos. It's a really good uh, uh, app site, uh, app, but the thing with, with um, eBird is that um, it is 
uh, I don't know, it is producing a generation of e birders that um, just go out and um, chase other people's um, sightings. At least that's what I've heard anyways. Um, it's becoming super popular. Um, there's Elia, Melissa, and Kevin and Roger. These are all avid e-birders, and this is at an awards night for getting the most species um, in Vancouver uh, during, uh, during the course of the year. A really good way of, of uh, uh, learning your birds is getting involved. Um, there's all kinds of opportunities. These are uh, Chris's bird count um, circles um, throughout Western Canada. So each of these orange circles uh, has a Chris's bird count. This is probably uh, the most popular of all the um, organized uh, birding events. <clears throat> the Birthdays Canada has lots of other programs. Um, you've got your uh, Long billed curl on your right, aerial insectivores. Uh, Angela talked uh, earlier about the nocturnal uh, uh, surveys. But there's all kinds of different programs that if uh, people want to get involved with, um, they can do a bit of citizen science. And most of all, this is the Manning Park Bird Blitz. Um, sharing your experiences with others is a lot of fun and a good way of learning. Um, you have your Manning, your Manning Park uh, uh, bird blitz. There's a Skagit bird blitz. Uh, we also have the uh, uh, Metal Art Festival that offers tours. Okay, now I'm gonna go into something totally different. Those are organizations and some of the equipment you might use. We'll just quickly go through <laughs> some of the, uh, the, the hazards of birding. Um, here I am, this is an in Panama, and I'm removing ticks um, from my, uh, one of the uh, tour members. Um, in recent years, because of the warmer weather, ticks can be a hazard, and especially um, in, in the interior valleys, uh, the Okanag and the Thompson and all that, uh, ticks can be a really um, a real hazard. In British Columbia, if you're going to be out in the field, watch out for black bears. Um, this one um, is a typical aggressive posture of a black bear. Um, uh, ears are up, uh, it's showing its size, uh, it's alert, it's looking up. Um, I've had, I don't know, hundreds of encounters uh, with, of bears and I've been charged, I think five, six times. I, I've never had a problem. And um, the best thing to do with bears is really be bear aware and, um, if you see a bear and it doesn't move away, because most of them just run away anyways, uh, the best is just to backtrack and maybe take a different route or uh, let the bear go in peace. Um, <clears throat> it's very rare, um, but it does happen. Uh, in fact, it was attacked just uh, not too long ago, but um, well, it's just good to be alert. Uh, cougars are pretty common in some parts of the um, uh, province. This cougar was um, at Hamathco camp. The um, camp dog had treated it. Um, so we were able to take nice pictures of it. <clears throat> Not so much here, but in um, foreign countries, um, oh, stinks can be a problem. This is a cross pit viper in um, Argentina. Um, there's a lot of places uh, uh, like in Punta Rasa marshes where there's all kinds of signs alerting you to the snake's presence. And um, I've actually seen a couple, so they're fairly common. You just have to be really aware, make sure you uh, wear good sturdy hiking boots and whatnot. Um, here in British Columbia, we only have one poison snake and that's the uh, uh, great base or the western rattlesnake and it's not that poisonous um it's extremely rare to get be, uh, bitten oh this is an example of what not to do i have this love of uh, reptiles um i was fortunate when i caught this amethystine um python because it's i made the correct identification but um in retrospect um It'd be, it's very unwise to <laughs> handle wild animals like this. Flies can be a real nuisance. Uh, these are bush flies in Australia. Um, there's, they don't bite, but there's hundreds of them. 
uh, most people birding are familiar with mosquitoes. We've got uh, deer flies and horse flies and stable flies and um, they're more of a nuisance as long as you wear repellent and have a good bug hat and good shoes. Um, most of the time it's okay. Uh, another hazard um, is my son took a picture of a bird, bird flew over. <laughs> Okay, so you got your equipment and everything, uh, you're out in the fields, so basically birding is just going to go out there and you're going to uh, slowly walk um, and <laughs> look, for, look for movement, listen for birds, watch them, and then with your book and your guide, you're going to do your best to identify them. <clears throat> identification isn't, um, uh, oh boy, identification uh, is basically looking at everything. Um, so you want to be looking at bill shape, the size of the bird, the behavior of the bird, how it's calling, uh, the feathers, uh, the whole bit. Um, here's uh, uh, comparisons between birds are extremely important in groups. Here's a Buick's right on the left and a Pacific uh, right on the right. Describing birds, uh, 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 bills is really uh, important, um, especially bills actually for a lot of species, for gulls, uh, just it's for a variety of number of species. Um, here's a few descriptors of bill shapes. Um, uh, these are um, African um, larks. Uh, so they have upturned, swollen, but um, just descriptive terms for the different bills. Mm, also important is uh, knowing all your feather groupings. You have to know these uh, uh, parts of the birds because this is what uh, uh, in your book they'll be referring to these parts of the birds. So hopefully everyone will be able to see my, my cursor here. So here's your wing. And then these feathers out here, these will be your primaries, these are your flight feathers. From here, no, from here in, these are your secondaries. Um, these feathers you can't see too well, but come along here are your tertials. And these are long feathers that protect uh, the primaries and secondaries or when the wing is folded. And then you got your carpal bar your carp with your greater coverts. No, well, actually your greater coverts, lesser coverts or median coverts, that's your coverts. This would be the tail or rectrices. And that would be your rump, your back, your nape or your neck. There's your, um, this would be the nape, crown. Anyways, uh, learning bird parts is very important. Here's a bird that a lot of people see, um, white throat sparrow. Um, this would right here, the, this would be the throat. This would be the chain right underneath the bill. This would be the throat. Here's your lores. This is your eyebrow shape. This would be the lores. Here's your crown stripe. These are your mantle. These are your mantle streaks. Here's your upper breast, your vent, belly, and then your lesser coverts, medium coverts, greater coverts, and your tail feathers, rectrices. This part's for white throat sparrow. When, okay. So when to go uh, burning or where to go uh, burning depends on what you need. Generally, if you want to go uh, in the spring and summer, you want to go early in the morning. Here we are. This is in Alberta. We're looking for sedren. And I think we believe we got up at like 4 a.m. or 3 a.m., but a good time in the summer. So <clears throat> we briefly went through just who, why, where. Uh, sorry. Now I want to go to a whole bunch of different hot spots um, uh, around Vancouver. We got your White Rock Pier. It was an excellent winter spot um, that is repaired. Um, and it's uh, super good for 
great views of sea docks. You can get all three scoters here. You can get, uh, it's really good for loons and greaves. If you uh, walk up north, uh, or I should say, if you walk west, um, away uh, towards the rocks, you can get barrels, golden eyes, harlequins. And here we have some white wing scoters on your left with the white on the eye and a couple of surf scooters. It's probably the best place in Vancouver to photograph uh, sea ducks. <clears throat> the specialty of uh, White Rock Pier is uh, the ear grebe. You're not gonna see it in this plumage. This is a, um, in breeding plumage in um, Elizabeth Lake in Cranbrook. Um, but we'll get them in winter, um, in winter plumage where they're black and white. Um, they do stick out. Um, you have to look at the cell differences from horn grebe. They do have an up curve bill, but it's the only regular locality for eared grebes uh, really um, in the Vancouver area. It's not the best uh, site for it, but the end of the White Rock Pier has a jetty. And if you look carefully, quite often in the high tide, you get black uh, turnstones roosting on it. Um, a better place would be to go to uh, Tawasun, very terminal for your rock shore birds. Um, okay, another uh, excellent winter um, hotspot. Well, not just winter, but from pretty well from uh, October all the way through to uh, April is Rifle Refuge, probably one of the most famous uh, burning spots in Vancouver. Uh, it hosts just a, a huge number of birds from the shore, everything actually, shorebirds, waterfowl, songbirds. Probably most famous for BC's only um, non, this is a wintering population of black crown uh, night herons. This is an adult bird, two or three birds um, set sometimes in the open, but usually hidden in the trees along the uh, entrance slough. And rifle is an excellent spot for um, owls, uh, great horned owls and nests there. And uh, during the winter, it's if you look hard enough, you should be able to find yourself a northern solid owl. They're usually found in the hollies uh, or in the uh, branches that sweep over the uh, ditches. Um, yeah, it's boasted great great owl, long-eared owls as well. Uh, it's most famous. Well, these are trumpeter swans, but um, it's very famous for not just swans, but thousands of snow geese. That literally, Rifle Refuge literally has all the dabblers and bay ducks that you can imagine. Okay, this is Park. This is a uh, I would consider this a, a spring site more than everything than anything else. It's a large oh, internet is unstable. Um, it's most famous for this bird. This is a mountain bluebird. Every spring, uh, mostly in April, uh, you can get to a few of these uh, beautiful mountain bluebirds. This is another bird that well, actually some are reported today. It's a scarce migrant in May. It's a Western Kingbird, um, but Colony Farms um, used to be uh, one of the few sites in Vancouver where um, these things bred. Um, I don't know, Island Regional Park is probably one, is what actually used to be one of the most famous spots in all of Canada, uh, particularly for shorebirds. Iona has lost a lot of its, uh, I don't know, its bounty of birds. It's not half as good as it used to be, but every year it still consistently uh, um, produces rarities. Um, this is the uh, iconic bird of uh, Iona Island, yellow-headed blackbird. It's the only sort of population uh, west of the Cascades. <laughs> and probably one of the most uh, photographed uh, birds um, in the park. Um, in later on in the summer, the water levels go down. Uh, if you're lucky, you can see a Virginia rail. Um, in addition to Virginia rail, um, 
in the uh, inner ponds, you can get huge numbers of shorebirds, but particularly um, at the, or especially during the high tide and in just in a short time period between very late April and early May. Um, right now, it's, it hasn't been good recently, but um, in past years, it's uh, hosted thousands of birds. Um, I was very, very good for waterfowl, probably the best place to see all kinds of uh, waterfowl super close, um, included uh, are almost sort of, maybe I wouldn't call it annual, but um, uh, all, an almost annual bird is tough to dock. That would be the bird that's in the center. Um, the other birds here are lesser scop. You can see they have a little peak to their heads right here. Here is Queen Elizabeth Park. This is another um, excellent um, spring site. It's now is an excellent time to go. Um, in April, it's one of the more reliable spots for this bird. This is the Townsend Solitaire. You can usually find it around the quarry, um, but it also boasts um, a whole bunch of other um, uh, birds that are uh, interior. Um, Every spring, uh, spring uh, about, let's say, last few days of April, the first week of May, um, red nape sap sucker, dusky fly catcher, calliope hummingbird, those interior type species are often seen at Queensbury Park. The park is also known for a lot of fly catchers. Now, if you're to go, um, with a little pressure anyways, um, you could probably find Hammond's fly catcher and Pacific Slope fly catcher. This is a uh, Western wood peewee. Um, we know that because it doesn't really have much of an eye ring and the dark head, a bit of a crested look. Um, like I said earlier, um, the park, boasts a variety of different songs, birds, uh, songbirds, particularly in the spring. This one is declining rapidly in Canada and is a bit of a now. Yeah, it's got a huge marsh. It's got some beautiful riparian woodlands probably known for a bunch, but just three sort of localized species that uh, are found, or I should say breed here, but a um, few other places. You'd have to go to Sham Lake. One of them would be the great catbird. They're um, really good mimics, uh, usually hidden uh, skulking. You can hear them quite readily, but they do come out with squeaking and that. Um, Another bird that's uh, special to uh, pit meadows is the American Red Star. You can find this along the nature trail. This is a, a I think it's a, looks like a molting male and definitely wasn't taken at pit meadows. You can see that the leaves are oak leaves. Um, and um, if you were to walk uh, from, let's say late mid-May to uh, through June, and if you're lucky and listen hardy, you should be able to see um, one or two of these guys in the American Red Star. Driving to, to pit meadows, you're probably gonna um, find this bird because they're conspicuous and aggressive. This is an Eastern Kingbird, um, called Kingbird because of his aggressiveness, um, easy to identify, the white tip tail, the black head. Another excellent site uh, for uh, summer are the mountain parks. This is Cypress Provincial Park and another um, really good one is um, Mount Seymour. Both, par both these parks uh, boast populations of uh, sooty grouse. You can usually hear them in April, or at least the males are booming away, but it can be really difficult to see at that time. If you were to come later in the summer, July, August, you can often see females and broods of these guys um, along the trails. <coughs> Excuse me. In very late fall and early winter, uh, when the finches are moving around looking for conifer seeds, um, 
in eruptive years, sometimes you can get lucky and you can get uh, winter finches like this pine grosbeak. This was actually taken, I don't know if it, it might have been taken at Maplewood uh, Flats this year. This was a, an okay year for finches. But you know, the, you can also get things like red crossbill, white winged crossbill. Um, another bird typical of uh, the mountains, uh, it's the Canada jay, well known to most people. But thanks to global warming, um, it's declining. Uh, part of the reason might be that they breed um, super early, um, they capture foods in these saliva type balls. But because of global warming, um, their food isn't keeping. Okay, this is down at Jelly, uh, Jetty. Uh, this is an excellent place uh, for fall migration. It has full of, uh, well, it's really good for tundra type um, songbirds. If you go to September, I own a jetty. If you can beat the crowds, go early in the morning or perhaps go on a day that's, uh, uh, I don't know, bad conditions and there's not so many people walk the jetty. There's an excellent chance that you'll run into one of these guys. This is a horn lark. You can tell with the, uh, the, the particular face, black teardrop and the black crescent. Mm -hmm. There's another bird that uh, frequents the jetty in the fall. This is a female Lapland longspur. It's got the conical bill. You can't really see it, but it does have a bit of a chestnut uh, a nape here. Uh, usually found in big flocks in the winter in, in huge fields. They do winter locally, but they're really hard to see. Sumas prairie has big flocks of them, um, sometimes delta, but they're usually right in the middle of the field. So the jetty is one of the better places to uh, see these uh, buntings. If you're really lucky and uh, you're a diligent scoper, if you go to the end of uh, the Iona Island jetty in last few days of May and early June, you could chance upon this. Uh, you might get parasitic Jaeger, but you might get a Sabine's gull um, because they're almost annual, but they have a very short window and a uh, scope is required because usually the birds are really far out. Boundary Bay, this is probably one of the, that probably has, well, it doesn't probably, it has the highest population of birds throughout the winter in all of uh, uh, Canada. It's uh, very famous for its huge numbers of shorebirds. In the wintertime, it has shorebirds like these Dunlin um, during the passage, that would be spring and fall. Uh, it's mostly Western sandpipers. Uh, in addition to the, the, those sandpipers, every other species has been see, seen. Uh, it's a re, you know, really important to have a scope out there. With all the shorebirds comes the falcons, and it's one of the better sites to enjoy hunting peregrine falcons. And one of the things about Boundary Bay is that it's really, uh, for shorebirds anyways, it's extremely tide dependent. Um, you want to be, you want to go there um, either on a falling or dropping tide. Uh, the best times to go would be late August, early September. That's at that time of year, it's usually an evening tide that's high. And you want to go, uh, let's say, approximately 11 and 12 feet go before it's high and once it's at about 14 feet um, most of the mud flats are all the mud flats are covered <clears throat> so you have a short period of window as the tide goes up uh, to view uh, the birds um, when it's low the birds are too far out you can't really see them um, the farm fields um, have a lot of other birds, including um, the farms that boast a whole bunch of blackbirds. If you look, this is a brewer's blackbird and a breeding bird, a nice glossy head. If you search through them carefully enough, 
you could potentially see a yellow-headed blackbird. And here's a yellow blackbird in Delta with a bunch of starlings. Um, it's not the best picture, but you can see it's a blackbird with a yellow throat, hence. <laughs> and um, so it's always worth it to check the blackbird fo uh, flocks in the fall. That would be late fall, early winter for rusties and yellow-headed blackbird. And I think this is one of the last sites I've got here. Another hot spot for birding, um, primarily fall, winter is Blackie Spit. Um, Blackie Spit is an amazing spot for, yeah, it has a lot of waterfowl. Uh, these are a couple of northern pintail, but it's one of the best spots to get good looks of Eurasian widgeon. And um, quite often, the at loons, dreams. It's best to bird blacky spit at a lower or a rising tide. Um, when the tide is high, most of the shore birds leave, um, even though usually um, the marble godwits, they usually stick around um, to roost with the ducks. Uh, this has been one of the more reliable spots to get uh, marbled goblet, these shorebirds um, in Vancouver. Um, and in some years, this year in particular, there was up to four of these guys. There was four snow buntings fre frequenting the uh, 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 spit. It has a lot of open country birds. You can get things like meadowlarks and uh, other things there. I've seen uh, I think brambling there. And that would be it. Uh, most important thing for <laughs> in birding is to go have fun. Mm. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Oh, I do, if people want, um, I do have a few slides. We could spend like two minutes a piece and um, grab your books, see what you can come up with. Um, here's the, here, this will be the first picture. I don't know if, I don't have a timer or something else. Okay, so this is the first picture. If people want to, you can grab a book. Oh. And identify all the birds that you can in this picture. Oh, okay. I was going to do it two minutes. Okay. Um, here's the next slide. Um, identify as many species as you can in the picture.
Here's a book. Right here. Okay, another, the next one. Same thing, <laughs> if you can, identify as many birds or as many species as possible. Okay, you're okay. I'll, I'll just do a minute. Oh, okay, sorry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okie doke, I'll do uh, the very next one. And finally, the last bird, give this one a shot.
Okay, um, we're finished now. Um, do you want to unmute? Isn't he going to be Nigel, do you want to unmute? Yes, uh, Tom. So are you going to tell us what the birds are? No. <laughs> no, definitely not. That's something you guys get to figure out. That's the okay. whole idea. No, I will. Very quickly, um, it is kind of a trick. I think most people will recognize the birds in the very first. This was the first one here. Yeah. So on your right, you've got a house finch, a male. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's the bright red eyebrow and everything, the colors. And then in the center here, you've, you've got a winter plumage goldfinch facing away. Okay. Um, you can tell it's a finch. It's got a nice forked tail. The black wings with the huge wing bars. It's obvious. Now, here, though, this is a lesser goldfinch. Oh, okay. This was taken in winter. And this bird is still all small and green, whereas goldfinches in winter lose their yellow or kind of brownie. And also, you'll notice the wings are completely different. This has got one little uh, white uh, bar uh, on the, um, I think, it's just secondaries. And these have huge white wing bars. Now, going down, you're not, you don't really have too much. But I'm guessing uh, this bird right down here, the very bottom, the cursor is. Is likely a pine siskin. Mm -hmm. <coughs> it's small, it's finch, it's all streaked. I don't see any reddish. It's just unfortunate we can't. So okay, that was the first. This is a really difficult one. But okay, here we are. There, I said there was all in bush climbing the curve. So we have gulls. We know these are big gulls, they're glaucosine gulls, they don't have black primary. So they're adult gulls, they're a big one, you know, gray, so they're glaucous and gulls, which means that this is a pretty big bird. This bird is obviously a very dark backed gull, and we only have a couple of those in British Columbia. Uh, one would be a western gull, and the other one would be a slaty backed gull. Um, I should have told you, well, it wouldn't have really matter. And this is a third cycle bird, so this is a third year bird. Um, in third winter or third, let's say third summer or uh, winter plumage, Western gulls have a nice clean white head. This is all streaky. And plus it's got a bit of streaking on the eye. This is a slaty back gull. Now to confirm it, you probably have to see the wings open and see the teardrops, but uh, just, just alone like this, you saw that you go um, slaty back gull. You get the the very poor pictures, but the other birds here, no. the dark heads, the little uh, bills, the white front. These are common murs. Murs. Oh. And then, this is kind of a tricky dude. This is nasty, but this is okay. This is how it goes. Back here we have a gull, it, but it's very dark headed. It's not the light brown of a glaucous wing gull. It's a dark brown. Plus, it has a really bicolored pink or flesh colored with a black tip. This is a young uh, first year, second year um, California gull, this one right here. So we have Galakas wing gulls, nice adults with their uh, uh, red tip bills. A third, this will be like a third uh, summer, if you want to call it that, a, a slaty back gull, um, a California gull and common mers. Okay. This one's an uh, uh, interesting picture. Um, a lot of gulls loafing. This was taken um, actually in the Okanagan. So, oh boy. Okay, we have a couple of, we have some gulls here. We have gulls with gray wing tips and big. This looks like a big gull with pink legs. And we have smaller ones here with black wing tips. The big one, you can't really, well, you can see it here. The big ones here don't have black, but the gray. So these are glaucous wing gulls. 
this was in the Okanagan where this, you know, they're supposed to be scarce, but actually they're quite calmer these days. And right here we have another 30 year bird. These smaller birds have black wing tips. They're smaller and you can kind of see they don't have pink legs. They have kind of greenish legs with the black. And then they have a red spot and a black spot. Not just a red spot, but a red and a black. These are California gulls right here. Um, in the back here, we have a gull, um, but it looks almost as big as say, this glaucus wing. But um, interesting enough, it looks like it has a pale eye. That's because, and a very pale mantle actually, it's got a quite light mantle. Um, this is an adult herring gull. Herring gulls have a very pale mantle and they have a white eye and a big gull, which leads us to one more gull, this dark thing. This is a dark back gull. And it's smaller than a glaucus wing, maybe slightly bigger than these Californias, but it has a pale eye. This is a, a lesser black back gull. This is what you, you can't see it now, but I think the, the, if, yeah. Oops. Yeah, so anyways, a lesser blackback gull, very dark mantle, white eye, halfway between just a bit bigger than a cowley and a, a glock swing gull. Here, um, we don't know, it's hard to say, we can't really see the bill, um, but we can guess, it looks kind of robin like it's a thrush. Uh, but what thrush is it? Well, it doesn't have a lot of spotting on it, that's for sure. It's got a bit of buffy here. And it all seems to be pretty uniform. The tail doesn't really contrast that much with the back. This is a veery. If it had been a swainter stripe, it'd be darker spotting here. You wouldn't have the entire uh, russet uh, top, and it'd be sort of, uh, sort of buffiness on the face. Well, this one looks like it could be easy. Oh, isn't that a Wilson's Warbler? But no, it has dark lores and the eye is all a yellow face. If you were birding, let's say out in Tofino or maybe in your backyard out in Cecil Green one fall or maybe in June, well, I wouldn't know, this wouldn't be a June bird, in fall, you happen across this, you'd be looking at a hooded warbler. So the features are pretty subtle the dark lures, the yellow face, but basically this is a fall bird is what you're looking for. Anyways, enough of that, <laughs> Tom Fleury. Um, is there any questions? Uh, Tom, there yeah. was uh, some, I'm just gonna go back to the chat uh, earlier. Uh, you were talking about uh, you were uh, the name of the store you referred to. Oh, Peely Wings Nature Store. Where, where is that in Vancouver or is that? No, it's Ontario. Okay, so you it would be check their website and it, it'd be mail order. Yep. Okay, and you uh, said also people have asked the best store to buy binoculars is that Peely as well or? Yep. Okay. Uh, another person asked, what numbers should I look for in binoculars? Eight by what? Oh, what, what? boy. Hmm. Eight by 40s. Um, yeah, 10 by 50. Eight by 40, eight by 42s. Yeah. Okay. At least five times the magnification. Okay, great. And and in in the chat, someone did put you know you had referred to the Audubon.org gear. Um, someone put the link in the chat, so if people want to go to the chat, they can get that website for the Audubon. Oh, for which one? Um, eBird or? No, it was for the Audubon.org forward slash gear forward slash binocular guide. Oh, I you see. Suggest, you had suggested that as, uh, I believe, uh, for getting information about selecting binoculars, I think. Well, for getting binoculars, you probably, prob people would probably be best to go, this is what I did, and go to Bird, Bird Watchers Digest. Um, 
American Birding Association, Audubon, go to these bird clubs, the UK, and check out their reviews. Okay. 